Welcome to The Art of Medicine, the program that explores the arts, business, and clinical aspects of the practice of medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Andrew Wilner. Today, I'm excited to speak with Nate Renicky. Nate is the primary advisor at Physician Family Financial Advisors and co-host of their podcast. Nate counsels physicians to structure their careers to avoid burnout and achieve financial goals. <laughs> I think these days that's a tall order, so I'm really interested to hear what Nate has to say. But before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsor, locumstory.com. Maybe you're curious about locums and how it might fit into your career story, but do you know all the different reasons physicians choose locums and how it works for them? At locumstory.com, you can hear firsthand stories as diverse as physicians themselves. There's not one solution for everyone. The variety of opportunities might surprise you. Locum Story is an unbiased educational resource. It has tools that let you explore trends in your specialty and compare different locums agencies. There's even a simple quiz to see if locums is right for you. Do your own research at locumstory.com. It's easy. One more thing before we get started, there's a new link with every podcast. Just click where it says fan mail and you can text me your feedback about this and any other episode. I'm really, really interested, always trying to make this more relevant, more helpful podcast. And now to my guest, welcome Nate Renicky. Thanks for having me on. I was I was listening to some podcasts of yours earlier, and I know you most mostly have doctors on, so it's an honor to be here. Although I'm not a doctor. Yeah, yeah, it's probably about fifty fifty now. I try okay. to have financial advisors um, because you know that's something that everyone struggles with, and physicians are in you know they're kind of in their own sort of zone when it comes to finances. They got their own special problems. And, uh, you know, we've talked about that before, you know, starting to earn late. You know, I didn't have my first real job, for example. I think I was in my mid thirties right. you know, before I yeah. got out of training. I'd never saved a penny. That's All right. right. So why should I listen to you? <laughs> What's your financial background? Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I, I think something that is pretty unique about us, so not necessarily me, but us, is that we have been physician only, you know, serving only, exclusively physicians for, I believe, twenty years. Well, so not me, not me for twenty years, but the the owner of the firm, his name's Ben. He's a co-host on our podcast. Um, he has worked exclusively with physicians. Maybe there was a couple people that stayed with them from their very early years, but many physicians for many years. And so I have, we have worked hundreds of financial plans for physicians and that's all we think about all day long so as physician finance uh it's funny the some of the advice i give every day to physicians is so clear in my mind and someone will come up to me that's uh, not a physician in my you know my normal day-to-day -day life and they're like what do i do here and then i start giving them advice i go wait a minute you did you're not you're not starting in when you're 35 you don't have three hundred thousand dollars in student loan debt and you don't make you know several you know, in the high six figures, I have to re completely reshape the way I'm thinking about my advice for them. Um, but this is something that is really good for financial advisors, I think, to be specialized in something, much like physicians, it's really difficult to be good at everything. Um, so we take it to heart, like we don't even serve uh, you know, dentists or anything like that, nothing against them. Uh, but we are very focused on physicians. And uh, that that. Is, seems to be very beneficial for our clients. I mean, we understand their finances, but we also understand their culture very well. Um, why else should you listen to us? Uh, we we try to get the highest certifications we possibly can. We know that means a lot in, in your world, um, in the physician world, a lot of training. So we're all certified financial planners. So a CFP, this, right? CFP, certified financial. Right. And are you what they call a fiduciary? Yes. So fiduciary is one of those words. Uh, the financial services industry tends to uh, dilute words a lot. <laughs> uh, so uh, we are fiduciaries, but I would I would describe it as fiduciaries to the highest standard possible, uh, which is in the nature of we run our 
this firm uh, and how we charge people even and the advice we give, it is it, fiduciary is the number one thing that we filter all our advice through. It's, and it's also how we filter how we charge clients through. Um, but fiduciary can, a lot of people will claim to be that and uh, it's really not true. So it's funny, I, I, I people ask me that a lot um, and I know that it doesn't hold a lot of water, but with a cert- being a certified financial planner, it does because you're held to that standard if you want to keep your CFP designation. So um, people dance around it in the financial services industry, but we do not. And what that standard means is that your responsibility is to your client first. In other words, you might, you're not going to sell him a product where you get a big commission and tell him that, hey, this is the best investment for you without telling him, oh, by the way, I'm getting a big cut. That's exactly right. Yeah. And, and, and typically in the industry, um, people, you know, professionals in this industry will drink their own Kool-Aid and convince themselves that something is Mm. best for their client, uh, when in reality it is not. Um, and we take that so far as we actually don't sell products at all. We don't make commissions. We we don't make, we don't charge assets under management fees. We charge a monthly subscription fee and do all financial planning and all, um, investing, uh, for that flat subscription fee. So if we refer you to a life insurance agent, we don't get a cut. And the life insurance agent that we refer you to, because we don't get a cut, if they give you any bad advice, they don't get any more referrals. <laughs> so uh, our uh, number one goal is to make sure that for that flat monthly subscription fee, you get the best advice possible. That is really you know, our only incentive, our only conflict of interest is that we would like for people to stay clients. That's bad. Now, I, are you local or do you take physicians from all over the country on Zoom calls like this? Yeah, we're we're all over the country and have been, gosh, maybe 10 years. Used to be local way back when, when everyone was only local. But I've been working from home, uh, doing Zoom calls. We meet on Google Meet, but uh, since 2018. So yeah, we clients all over the country. In fact, m- the majority of our clients are on the East Coast. Uh, they are very comfortable with advisors and they it's mm-hmm. kind of part of their culture there to have professional help in the money world. Uh, and also the time zone works. We're in Pacific time. So uh, when I start my day, they're close to lunchtime. Well, you know, I usually put this information at the end, but since we're talking about it, why don't you tell us how people can get in touch with you? Oh, sure. Uh, the easiest way is just go to physicianfamily.com. Our podcast is on there. Uh, you can get in touch with, with us on there. And, um, you know, there's if you go into our podcast, you can find a way just to ask questions. Um, so we answer questions that we get from, gosh, close to 300 physicians is, is who we serve. Um, and we, we take their questions and we blast them out to more than just those two ears that I'm talking to. So, um, yeah, you can get in touch with us or find us physicianfamily.com. You mentioned a podcast. Tell me about that. Yeah. So I have always loved podcasts. I remember when I was listening to podcasts and nobody really knew what they were. Um, and I was listening to radio shows that just cut their radio show up into podcast form. And I just loved it. I thought it was the best thing ever. I thought that would be cool to be on, uh, to be a guest on a podcast or something someday. And so when I uh, got to Physician Family, I said, "Hey, we should do a podcast." And it's a big lift, as you know, um, especially a big lift to make it really consistent and make it quality. Um, so we, you know, a few years later, I think our podcast has been three years running. So a couple years later, we finally decided to do it. And it was just Ben and I for a while. Actually, we did have a couple guests in the very beginning. Kind of, uh, we thought these people will never say yes, and somehow they said yes. So of course we took them, and and it's kind of like heroes of ours. One one wrote a book um, called Parenting with Love and Logic, and uh, it's just it's like a book that we everybody on the firm reads because we're all parents and uh, we take that very seriously. A physician family, like we we love to serve families because. One, kids make your finances more complex, but two, um, it really seems that people's heart is in the right place. You know, more kids you have, probably (laughs) the more your heart's in the right place with in life, I would say. Um, So we, you know, interviewed a few people, but then we kind of shifted to just Ben and I for a while. Um, 
And that was mainly just because it was difficult to manage getting a bunch of guests. I'm sure you have uh, troubles with that. And it also, we wanted to get sort of a core uh, set of episodes out there that answered the big major questions that we get all the time. So we would do these sort of longer form answering one singular question and deep diving into those questions. We did that for about a year and a half. And then um, we realized we we're just getting the same questions a lot uh, because, you know, new clients, they have the same questions and even old clients need to be reminded of the same thing. We thought, you know, it'd be cool if we could answer more than one question per episode. So for about maybe not, not that long, maybe six months, we just answer several questions an episode, just Ben and I, but we are trying to get guests now. So we're doing it once a week and we're hoping that every other week we can have a guest. Well, I mean, you know, like maybe the chairman of the Federal Reserve, you know, <laughs> yeah. somebody like that. <laughs> yeah. um, all right. Let's start with an easy question. Who needs a financial advisor? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I hope I surprise you with my answer because the answer is not every physician. It's just not. Um, financial. So let, let, there's there's sort of two aspects to this. There's the investing side. And then there's the planning side. The investing side, honestly, if you have an interest in this and you could dedicate an hour a week to just researching investing and you had the right resources, which honestly, doctors do have a great resource. Um, in, in this world, products, people, businesses created in the financial services industry, they, they start from solving a problem. And... Um, just like many, almost every business, right? But um, the the problem physicians have with their finances, uh, kind of the the vultures surrounded them mm -hmm. for years. Okay, they are have a target on their back. They are very very focused and dedicated to their work, and if they have any extra time, that it's probably spent on their family, and so they're not really all usually or historically they wouldn't be t really all that engaged within their money. And so financial advisors come out and they charge them exorbitant fees to, to give them advice about that. And what spawned out of that is, you know, when the internet age is a ton of people trying to save them. And that, that's actually partially uh, why this firm was started. Um, so there are tons of resources online for physicians that, to read. The, the hard part is finding the, the right one. Uh, there's a lot of resources online that are just looking for views just like anything online. <laughs> and uh, the wilder the advice, the more views you get. So mm. finding the right resource is important. Um, but once you found it, honestly, if you have the time and energy, I believe physicians are certainly smart enough to develop the expertise. It just it just takes some dedication. Um, so if, if you are that person, you're okay. Like you could do this. You could probably pay someone for a couple hours of advice to make sure you're not going down some crazy path uh, with your finances, but you could probably uh, nail it with your investments. Um, on the planning side, however, I don't believe there are great resources for planning. And um, that what I mean by planning is, you know, every family that comes through our doors, they get at least two plans. They get a retirement fund plan and they get a college fund plan. Um, and, you know, when, you, when you're set out to, to write a plan for yourself, a lot of times you don't, you can't take a step back and kind of look at yourself from an outsider's view. Hmm. Um, and so you might say, hey, I want to retire at 60 years old. And that's about it. Okay, well, how do you get there? That's one question. Well, you could save a ton of money. You could save a ton, just save every nickel. But I really believe that physicians should shy away from that approach to money because they're already all burning out. From work, and I, 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 if we don't solve this physician burnout problem, we're not going to have any d good doctors left. I mean, every doctor I talk to, the first second they come through the door, they want to retire in their fifties. I'm like, you're going to give twenty years to something that you, you, you devoted ten years of your life to training for. I, we're in bad shape if everybody, if every doctor retires at fifty years old. And so, uh, I prefer. That And this comes through really financial counseling with them for them to realize that if you find a job you enjoy and you've given this much of your life to it and you think back to when you wanted to become a doctor in the first place, unless your parents 
were the driving force there. But if you really enjoy medicine and you dedicated your life to it, why not find a job that is more manageable that you can work longer? Um, that's, you know, I'm not a doctor, but that's what I did. I was at a bank and it was not great. I didn't like the stuff they sold. I didn't like the environment there. So I left and I thought I'm doomed. I don't get to do my life's dream, which is help people with their finances because I was an economics major. This is just what I like to do. It's what my dad did. And I thought, I, well, I guess I'm never going back. And then I found this firm that charged a flat monthly subscription fee. And I and the the Ben, when he hired me, he said, I really want you to figure out the student loan thing. It's really hurting all my clients. Mm. I thought, you're going to pay me to talk about student loans? In the traditional world, if you have $300,000 in student loans, financial advisors won't even talk to you. Mm. You don't have money for them to make money on. And I thought, that is wild. How are you doing that? And he just has been dedicated the last probably 10 years to figuring out how can we charge people a flat, fair uh, monthly subscription fee that makes sense for them, like it's, it saves them money, but also can support a team of advisors that's required to do this level of planning. So um, the planning portion and the the financial counseling portion is something that it's very difficult to understand what you're going to get out of that unless you've experienced it. It's an experienced good. And many physicians don't realize that they may need help in that area. Um, but let's say you're perfectly happy with your work schedule. You love your job. You have plenty of time with your kids. You're not trying to find a way to balance resources between now and later. That is not something you need help with. And you just need investment stuff. Well, if you're interested in it, honestly, you don't need a financial advisor. You could buy index funds, save a bunch of money, and you will be fine. Who needs us? Uh, people who aren't interested in this. That That's a big thing. I mean, there's a lot of money on the table to with investments, with taxes, um, and there's a lot of life on the table. So if you need help with uh, a plan and you need someone to counsel you through these big decisions in life, like how much do I work? How much do I need to make? Can I take this job that sounds a lot better where I get to take spend more time with my children, but I'm going to make $100,000 less per year? That's what a plan gives you. Um, de determining how to pay for college when college the price of college has gone up by almost 7% per year for decades. How are we going to do that in the most tax efficient way possible? That's what a plan gets you. And then if you have no interest in how to save on tax, you don't keep up with the tax code, you don't investments make your eyes glaze over. Of course, you need a financial advisor, um, especially with with how much money physicians earn. Um, to the outside world, it seems like if you make three, four, five hundred thousand dollars, that you are rich. Well, I can tell you, I work with physicians every single day that make three, four, five hundred thousand dollars, and they're not swimming in the money. It's a marathon, and making some good tax decisions and some long, uh, some investment decisions with a long you know, view of your goal, uh, that's what gets you there. It's a marathon and it's not a sprint, despite uh, what the rest of the country thinks about physicians and their income. So I guess uh, putting it together, one of your anti-burnout recommendations would be instead of working harder and saving more so you can get out early, mm -hmm. you know, there's that fire yes. uh, retirement early uh, movement, uh, a better choice would be to find a different job where you might work less hard, maybe even earn less. But if you enjoy it and can work another 10 years at it, you're going to come out way ahead. Plus, you're not going to be miserable for the next 20 years. I mean, That's, that sounds pretty sensible. That That is, you, you've nailed it. So yeah, in the, if, if you circle this back to numbers, which I hate to do, but I just got off a call where I did this, so it's fresh. All right. So if you look at a retirement plan um, and you look at what it would take to to build up enough retirement assets to retire at 50, you have to save an exorbitant amount of money. And the reason you do is that our system is not set up for you to retire in your 50s. You don't get Social Security. You don't get any of the, the benefits that you get in your mid-60s. Uh, Medicare. Help you. Medicare, all of that. You don't You don't get any of it. So it's on you. You have to have millions of dollars in a taxable account that you didn't get a ton of benefit putting the money in. You get some tax benefit taking it out. Um, so you'd have to save so much cash to retire for an extra, let's say, 10 years. 
versus, and by the way, most people who do this, they despise their job while they're doing it. They're trying to, they're running from their job. What a miserable life to 50 years old. Like I, I just, I couldn't do it. I, I took less. I gave up the dream of making financial advisor money. I, I did all that myself before I even thought I was going to work here. I was like, this is miserable. Never see your kids so, so that right when they leave the house, you're retired. It makes no sense. Um, and then even people who want to retire in their mid, you know, 55 and they kind of like their job. I don't see them do it. They don't do it. They, they show up at 55 years old, like, okay, it's time. They're like, well, maybe I'll work just a little less. I'm like, so when that happens hundreds of times, right, but right before your eyes, you start to, you can't help yourself in my position, but to say, Hey, look, let's just cut to the chase. This isn't happening. You're not going to retire at 55. You, you like your job. I don't know wh why you want this goal. And the reason you say that isn't so that they just save less and that they're less financially secure. It's so that they can have a perspective that they can enjoy some life now. I mean, an optimal plan, an optimal financial plan is not the one where you die with the most money, right? It's the one where you balance today's resources with the resources that you will need when you can no longer or you don't want to work. A much better plan would be for someone to say, I want to be prepared to be financially independent, maybe in my early 60s, but I also want to work part-time from 60 to 65. And a physician who does that, it is almost, it is difficult to not be able to do that with the right, like very simple strategy. It's really not that difficult. You don't have to do crazy investments. You don't have to build a real estate empire. You don't have to do anything. You just need to be smart with your taxes take a long-term approach to investing and know that you're going to need to scale back over time and be prepared to do that. And so once the kids are out of the house, like what do you spend $500,000 on <laughs> unless you're, you know, you just keep upgrading in house, but yeah. I've seen people cut back and all of a sudden they make 250 and they're like, Oh, this isn't that bad. This is plenty of money. How about locum tenens? Have you seen that as a way that some physicians have avoided this sort of uh, uh, doomsday job scenario where they have working part time or just uh, even full time locums instead of their previous job? Is that have you run into that? I have seen that. Um, it, 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 it takes a special person to to sign up for that. Um, and, and by special, I mean, for whatever reason, there is feels like there's less security. But if you've never done it feels like that, but I've seen it and I know it, they'll be totally fine, but they're just used to um, a steady paycheck that's exactly the same every month. Um, so if, if you're considering that, like the listeners are either in locums or, you know, by the way, do you have some community where these where your listeners talk? To each other? You know, that is a really interesting question because, uh, and, and there's some history there because we've tried to sort of approach that. And it turns out that locum tenens physicians are very heterogeneous. Okay. <laughs> You've got out of, you know, residency guys who are looking for their permanent job and working, you know, until then. And you've got guys like me that are sort of on their tail end of their mm -hmm. careers and men and women and families and people that want to travel. And so there is not like a local, you know, like there's organizations in medicine for ER medicine and every kind of medicine. There's no locum tenens medicine organization for, right. there. there is a parent for the staffing companies, but not for individuals. And uh, I think it is a need and no one's quite figured out how to do that. So yeah, uh, I think that's a difficult. podcast topic for you. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, it sounds difficult, but the reason I asked is it would be great if there was one because people could kind of, um, you know, talk it through with each other. But I, I have seen physicians who they get tired of their job or they get tired of politics a lot, paperwork and politics. And so they say, well, there's this option and they think I'm going to like shoot it down. No, stay with the security. And I've seen it work out lots of times, make plenty of money. And the th it just requires a little bit more planning. Like in mm -hmm. my in my world, if someone tells me that, I, I think it's great. But the planning opportunities actually are abundant. I mean, you can... You have more opportunities to save more in retirement accounts because you're a 1099 employee. Um, the, the, there's also just a little extra planning that comes with taxes. You have to make quarterly payments and something that can really 
in the beginning and sometimes forever can uh, hurt locum tenens uh, and workers is they're always nervous about their tax bill. They're terrified of it. Mm. And so if you don't plan for those payments, like I would get a professional, a CPA that helps you plan for that. And, and the reason that's, uh, that hurts them is they're piling up cash, like too much cash because they're terrified of their tax bill. So they're all constantly piling up too much cash. Their emergency fund gets bigger and bigger and bigger. They're no longer comfortable, even if they have a hundred thousand dollars in cash. And so having a good plan there will allow you to break off what you don't need for tax bills and uh, invest the difference. And, you know, a, a really good solid financial plan, you have an emergency fund and a tax fund, and then everything else you can safely invest um, and, and take a get a better return than whatever the bank's offering. But um, I have seen people experience a lot of freedom with this. In fact, I just spoke with um, a doc who switched to locum tenens, and he asked me if, if I thought he could take Fridays off, which would mean he'd make $100,000 less and he was way on track for retirement. He loved his job. I said, and he's like, but I, I would get to spend Fridays with my family. I said, I think that's the best $100,000 you could spend. I mean, he makes plenty of money. And if you know how much is enough, how much is enough? Like the, these people who it's it's all about the numbers in their bank account. Like I, I spoke with a doctor yesterday. He has 6 million bucks and he can't work less than 60 hours a week in his brain. Well, I have to, like they, they need me. I'm like, well, would you like to would you like to burn out in the next year, or would you like for them to have part of you for the next ten years? You know, so and very, very interesting. First, let me just say, if if uh, for the audience, if you're new to this program, the Art of Medicine, there are a couple episodes with certified public accountants who do specialize uh, in physicians who uh, do locums. So mm -hmm. just scroll down and you find those programs. And there, there are specific, as you said, you have to pay quarterly taxes. So that requires a little more planning. Uh, health insurance uh, is not going to be covered by your employer. There are very important things to know, but there aren't hundreds of them. There's right. just kind of a few Im important ones. And you do need a CPA who is familiar with mm -hmm. self-employed uh, individuals. But you, you just touched on something is uh you know is the perception of of how much money is enough mm -hmm. and uh you know and there's this thing called a lifestyle creep yes. right and uh, where your home homes get bigger and bigger and cars get more and more expensive and trips get more and more exotic and restaurants get fancier and fancier and wines get more and more expensive and and the next thing you know you know, $6 million isn't enough. So, right. so how do you talk to physicians about, about that? Well, to be honest, the spending is a difficult one and it's very unique to each person. And, you know, the lifestyle creep, people talk about this a lot and I do believe that it's there. I, I have clients that they spend entirely too much money. <laughs> That's just the reality. Um, but I will say that, um, a lot of times the lifestyle creep happens with children. And that mm -hmm. comes from everybody, including myself, everybody wants to give their child a better life than what they had. And what physicians that I talk to that are spending crazy money on their kids, you know, the house is for the kids, the cars are for the, the brand new car, three, three row seaters for the kids and um, everything's for the kids. And what they don't, what they can't grasp in a third uh, third party perspective is really all that does it for them is that if their parents weren't doctors and a lot, a lot of physicians we serve their parents you know modest upbringing they your children already have more security and a better life than you grew up with as far as it comes to money and they don't need all those things to ma make a good life in fact It'd probably be better if they didn't have those things and had more of you mm. around. I mean, the 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 people who talk to me about ra raising their kids with a better life, a lot of times they grew up with very present parents, which allowed them to become physicians in the first place. Mm. And so, uh, being present as a father or a mother is far more important than the brand new car or the big house or keeping up with the Joneses or whatever it is. Um, but beyond that, beyond lifestyle creep, this comes down to needing to understand your goal. I mean, goal setting is something that a lot of people talk about. Everyone thinks they know how to do it. But then when I get in the room with someone, I'm like, when do you want to retire? How much do you want to spend? Where do you want to retire? All these things. They have no idea. 
which makes sense. Uh, it's, sometimes it's 20 years away, but a good, a great goal that with when I'm speaking with physicians, it gets developed over the years. I mean, the first time we, we have a plan for them, we say spend $10,000 a month in retirement because student loans are gone and mortgage is gone and retire at 60 years old. They kind of just throw it out there. It's like, well, I guess that sounds fine. And then the next time we meet with them, you know, every year to review their plan, I'm like, so how does that feel? Do you feel like you spend $10,000 a month? Well, you know, maybe a little more, maybe a little less. And okay, do you want to retire? Do you still want to retire at 60? It's so far out. I couldn't tell you. Well, do you like your job? I love my job. It's, it's I love my job. And I'm like, there's no chance you're retiring at 60. <laughs> now, it doesn't mean it shouldn't be your goal because maybe health gets in the way and you need to be prepared to retire at 60. But a great plan, a truly like um, a plan that adjusts with you over time, that is what's going to tell you what is enough. Because once you save all the money you need for college retirement, and that wraps in everything, student loans, mortgage, all that, what's left after an emergency fund and vacation fund, you can spend all right, That's one it. last question. Yeah. Side gigs. Side mm -hmm. gigs have been, are very in vogue for physicians. And I think we could actually do a whole episode on those. But my question to you is, have you seen that side gigs are adding a significant amount of money to physicians' income, or are they just kind of a distraction? They're a distraction. Um, that's what I see. Uh, and maybe that's different for everybody. There are some people that, you know, take on some side gigs and they make an extra hundred thousand dollars, but inevitably those people are very driven typically. And so what happens is they do that for a couple of years and then they become a partner in their practice and they no longer have time for side gigs. Um, and the, honestly, m there's a little bit of bias here for me personally, because, uh, you know, I maybe have fallen into the, those traps in the past in my younger years, uh, but I have found that if you focus on one thing and you focus all your attention and energy on one way of making money, um, you can make more money than you'll ever make in a side gig that's distracting you from that one thing. So that's my my experience. Uh, you know, 200 doctors, 300 doctors is a lot to me. It's not everybody, but uh, I would say focus on the thing that got you here. Very helpful. Nate, this has been a great discussion. Is there anything you'd like to add before we uh, wrap up? There isn't much. Um, you know, I think uh, physicians really uh, take a, a clear look at if you need a plan. Um, and if you if you don't, you there's plenty of resources online. But um, one thing I could add is that if you're just not sure if this is for you, you can uh, call us and we could we I promise you we will be honest on whether or not you need us or not or someone else. So that's about it. That's great. Well, Nate Renicky, thanks for joining me on The Art of Medicine. Before we close, I'd like to give another thanks to our sponsor, locumstory.com, a resource where providers can get real, unbiased answers about locum tenants. I'm Dr. Andrew Wilner. See you next time. This program is hosted, edited, and produced by Andrew Wilner, MD, FACP, FAAN. Guests receive no financial compensation for their appearance on the art of medicine. Andrew Wilner, MD, is Associate Professor of Neurology at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center, Memphis, Tennessee. Views, thoughts, and opinions expressed on this program belong solely to Dr. Wilner and his guests and not necessarily to their employers, organizations, or other group or individual. While this program intends to be informative, it is meant for entertainment purposes only. The Art of Medicine does not offer professional financial, legal, or medical advice. Dr. Wilner and his guests assume no responsibility or liability for any damages, financial or otherwise, that arise in connection with consuming this program's content. Thanks for watching. For more episodes of The Art of Medicine, please subscribe www.andrewwilner.com